I'm Dr. Henry Nasrallah, Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Uh, also uh, serve as Vice Chair for Education and Training and Director of the Schizophrenia Program. Uh, pleased to be here today just to give you a brief update about uh, the antipsychotic uh, medications. Uh, I'll be addressing those uh, at the AACP annual meeting uh, later today. Uh, Generally speaking, and all psychiatrists know that antipsychotic phar pharmacotherapy is an essential component of treating schizophrenia, even though it's not the only uh, treatment that we should be providing. It's one of many biopsychosocial approaches, but it's essential and vital to stabilize the psychotic symptoms uh, in order to be able then to do psychotherapeutic intervention and, and other uh, rehabilitative uh, treatments. Now, we've all been very aware of, of how the evolution of antipsychotic therapy has moved us from the old generation to the new generation, with uh, we call them typical to atypical, and all psychiatrists know that atypicality is defined as a minimization uh, of, of, of EPS, the extrapyramidal side effects, which were such a, an intolerable uh, group of side effects. Um, by group, I mean uh, dystonia, akathisia, dyskinesia, Parkinsonism, and then subsequently uh, tardive dyskinesia, NMS, tardive akathisia. There's a lot of uh, neurological side effects, which made them so intolerable that even though they worked on the uh, psychotic symptoms, uh, the patients just would not continue to take them the minute they left the hospital, many of them stopped them. And so that was uh, the, the lack of effectiveness, as we call it. Effectiveness is a combination of efficacy and patient acceptance, which is tolerability. Uh, together, that means, means the patient will stay on the drug and will stay well. That's effectiveness. So the old generation were not effective. The new generations, which were modeled after clozapine, uh, clozapine being the only antipsychotic ever discovered by accident, serendipitously, and found not to have any uh, extrapyramidal symptoms, practically zero. Uh, of course, that intrigued researchers and uh, and by digging further into what is it about clozapine that's different than, than the old generation drugs, uh, all of which have EPS, they found that it blocks serotonin, uh, serotonin 2, 2A receptors significantly more than blocking D2 receptors. Uh, the old drugs like Haldol is exactly the opposite. They block D2 dopamine receptors much more than serotonin receptors. So all the, the new generations were developed with that in mind. They all share that in common. However, while all of them have reduced the EPS and have this serotonergic uh, antagonism that mitigates the uh, antidopamine side effects, uh, unfortunately, it has emerged in the last decade, decade and a half, since the mid-90s when all the atypicals came to the market, that, that these drugs are associated with significant metabolic side effects. And so uh, this has kind of uh, put a damper on the excitement regarding atypicals, but, but, but by far they are still used uh, a lot more, much, much more than the older drugs. In fact, the older drugs have, have withered away, and I say for a good reason. Uh, not only is it because the EPS is, is a brain disorder uh, that is intolerable, uh, not that I like metabolic side effects, I detest weight gain and hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia and hypertension. And metabolic syndrome is, 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 is uh, conducive to cardiovascular risk. But we, we can manage it. We, we can do what we should do, diet and exercise counseling and changing the lifestyle, the sedentary living, the high caloric intake, the poor choice of food that our patients have developed simply because they cannot exercise good judgment about, about eating. Uh, or about exercising. But it's important to notice one emerging fact. Uh, it's actually a stunning fact that many clinicians have not been, uh, uh, I think, addressing or paying attention to. And, and that is the following, that in the last decade, over the past decade, there have been at least two dozen studies, like 25 to 30 studies and growing, showing that the older antipsychotics actually are neurotoxic. They actually induce apoptosis. They, they um, cause the brain to lose uh, cells and tissue uh, through apopto apoptosis. In addition to working on the psychosis, no doubt they do suppress psychosis, they block dopamine receptors, but they have other deleterious effects on the rest of the brain. 
So for all the decades that we used the older uh, phenothiazines and, and Haldol and, and the dibenzodiazepines and all of the other uh, conventional antipsychotics, the six classes of them, uh, we now realize that not only it is the EPS that you know, we, we, we should have helped our patient avoid, and we did by going to atypicals, but in contrast to the atypicals, they actually induce brain tissue loss. At the same time, just in the last eight, seven, eight years, we have a mounting uh, amount of data cumulatively showing that the atypicals actually do the opposite. Instead of inducing brain tissue loss, they also work on, this, uh, on the dopamine receptor and suppress delusions and hallucinations, uh, very much like the old drug. And in fact, I, I, honestly speaking, I don't think that they are superior in, in treating psychotic symptoms. The old and new generations are similar in their efficacy on delusions, hallucinations, but at least they avoid EPS. And by avoiding EPS, you, you avoid secondary negative symptoms, secondary cognitive deficits, secondary depression, and, and which, com which confounds the whole picture. And that's why uh, the, the, the atypicals look like they do a better job by avoiding excessive dopamine blockade, which has ripple effects on the psychopathology. But back to what I was saying, neuroplasticity, which has become a very hot area in neuroscience, especially psychiatry, it show, it, th th there's been numerous studies showing that the atypicals actually induce neurogenesis. They, they uh, turbocharge the process in the brain, which is uh, found in two locations, uh, in the uh, hippocampus, dentate gyrus, and in the subventricular zone. These are two little factories that all of us have in our brain, with, where the, the, the brain is producing little baby neurons. Uh, we call them progenitor cells, stem cells, if you like, but they're destined to become either neurons or glia because you need both for a unit of function, functional unit in the brain. So the atypicals, one after the other, were found in rats uh, to actually induce neurogenesis. And, and you can see it in the, under the microscope. Those, those new baby cells grow, mature, and then they leave the hippocampus like a plume of cells and they migrate to another area of the brain where they settle down and are incorporated in a functional unit. It's an amazing way of regenerating our brain, which all of us have, by the way. Normal people have that too, and assuming they're not taking drugs, having a severe medical illness, uh, not, not the diabetic, and not having a brain infection, and you know, especially no marijuana and all of that stuff. M m people will actually continually produce new, new brain cells. Patients with schizophrenia lose that ability and because of the illness, we don't know why, but the illness is, it, it, it basically degrades that process. And then on top of that, we used to give them the conventionals, which had added insult to injury. And so they lost more and more brain tissue with every episode, which has been documented now in many, many studies. The atypicals reverse that process. They induce neurogenesis. They increase the neurotropic factors, which, by the way, are critical for neurogenesis. Neurotropic factors are like nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotropic factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, fibroblast and uh, growth factor. There are several of those which are vital for the integrity of the brain. So if you lose then the, uh, these growth factors, which by the way we've, we found to be the case in, in the acute psychotic episode, the very first psychotic episode, they are down by like 60%. And we have no idea why. Schizophrenia is a, is a brain disease that is associated with loss of neurotropic factors. And by the way, depression was found to, to be the same thing. A huge drop in the BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factors. And, so, and, they, and patients with depression also lose tissue. Not as bad, not as severe as schizophrenia, which are brain-wide. They tend to be uh, restricted to the hippocampus and depression. But here's the, the good thing, is that the atypical antipsychotics, but not the typicals, induce this, the, produ or the production of new cells in contrast to losing cells. Apoptosis is massive pro programmed cell death, which has been shown to occur with, with uh, haloperidol and phenothiazines and, and published studies. And yet, it, it is amazing to me that this knowledge has not spilled down to the clinical setting, and I still see people using conventional antipsychotic, and, and that is really something, to me, that's harm. We now know it is harm, it is published, it is not just one study, numerous studies. So while the atypicals are not perfect by any means, they are the best thing we have right now, and we're working feverishly on developing another better mousetrap, and I personally believe that the glutamate system is emerging as our next great hope, uh, and there's a lot of data supporting uh, that uh, belief, 
that instead of, of uh, you know, suppressing dopaminergic activity, which is, which is certainly elevated inappropriately in the brains of people with psychosis, uh, actually uh, re-regulating and, 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 and basically correcting what we believe is a hypo function of the N-methyl D-aspartate, NMDA, glutamate receptor, may actually have the same effect as blocking dopamine receptors, but has additional uh, benefits, which is helping negative symptoms and helping cognitive deficits and helping neuroplasticity, because that NMDA receptor actually controls positive symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive deficits, and also has a lot to do with regeneration and neuroplasticity. And that's exactly what we see in schizophrenia. And so it's very hard to do. A lot of pharmaceutical companies are focusing on it in an innovative way. But my hope is that over the next few years, certainly before the end of this decade, we will have one or two or three tools, new tools, a third generation of, uh, uh, of, of antipsychotic, uh, maybe I should, should, we should call them more than antipsychotic, broad spectrum schizophrenia drugs that address all the unmet needs because negative symptoms and cognitive deficits are unmet needs that are not helped by the conventionals but we hope will be helped by the, the glutamatergic drugs. So I think it's exciting times for psychiatry and for our patients. Uh, let's give them hope. We'll do the best we can with what we have but always looking forward. We should all support research. Research is the answer to today's unmet needs and clinicians uh, should co co collaborate and encourage researchers to continually produce uh, new agents, new tools to fight these disabling brain disorders like schizophrenia. Thank you for your attention.